I am woman, hear me roar. Numbers too big to ignore. Do 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 do. Oh, hello, everybody. So Walter, the So Walter Jones Show. I'm here. It is the evening edition. Hey, how y'all is? Uh, come on in. The water is fine. Uh, today is a Tuesday. Yeah, uh, the third. It is the day before the fourth uh, white folks holiday. How y'all is? It's good to see you here. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. Had a, an amazing birthday party Saturday and this much sleep. Uh, and so I'm back. I'm back in the land of the living, among the land of the dying, and all of the other kind of stuff. It's 100 degrees outside. I'm in a cool office, and I'm just going to do a little bit of this, what I do, and what I'm known for doing is causing problems among household of faith and the worldly folks. If you're human and you were born of a woman, I'm a problem to you. Good. Good to see you. Uh-huh. Yeah. Ah, uh, Kendrick Scales, blessings to you. You got to learn that intro. <laughs> we'll talk about that later, y'all. I'll talk about my party later on. Uh, but thank for those, all of you who showed up and those of you who couldn't make it, but you sent some money. I, I, hallelujah, anyhow. We'll talk about that later. Thank you, Daphne. Amen. Um, black women. White women's fight. Mm. Ooh-wee. Ooh, to the wee-wee. <laughs> This ain't, this ain't pretty. Now, I'm going to lay, I ain't going to be hard on you because I know how sensitive this subject can be to some of you. I was looking at the wiki to the pedia, all right? It says African-American women's suffrage movement. African-American women's suffrage movement. Angela Johns, thank you. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, it says, as a women's suffrage movement gained popularity through uh, the 19th century, black folks, African American women were increasingly marginalized. That didn't surprise any of y'all, did it? No, African American women dealt not only with sexism of being withheld to vote, but also racism of white suffragists. Yeah, the white women were marching in the streets saying, We want our rights. You, you suppressing us, the ability and the right to vote. All right, and this is probably this is before they get again into that whole liberation movement and feminism and things like that. This is po this is pre-feminism liberation yada yada. Ah, oh, we want our rights, but the struggle for the vote did not end with the ratification of the Nineteenth Amendment. And then now, in some Southern states, African American women were unable to freely exercise their rights to vote until the nineteen sixties. Y'all remember that bill? Mm, the voting right bill. Yeah. However, these difficulties did not deter African American women in their effort to secure this vote. Now, the or the origin of this uh, of the women's suffrage movements <clears throat> they're tied to abolitionists, believe it or not. Upper class white women, in particular, first articulated their own oppression in their marriage. Ooh, see what y'all joining? Yeah in their marriage and the private sphere using the metaphor of slavery. That's what gays are using today. They calling it human, uh, the, uh, they calling it civil rights to be able to touch a man. I'm a man, so I'm gonna touch a man's um, particulars. And so I should have a right. It's my human right to do it. And I want you to change the law so that I can do that and be married to this dude. And so they use, it's amazing how people in this struggle ride off of the back of the, the oppressed black man and folk fall for it because they pass bills and first develop a political consciousness by mobility in support of abolitionists. Yeah, sad. The racism that defined the early 20th century made it so black women were oppressed from every side First, for their status as woman, and then again for their race, and many particular uh, 
uh, politically engaged African American women were primarily invested in matters of racial equality, with suffrage later materializing as a secondary goal. All right, so black women's problems and struggles and issues was not with her man, that was the white woman's issue, it was with her man. Does that make any sense to any of y'all? Mm -hmm. Yeah, man, I got some stuff here. Um, let me tell y'all something. The white woman is, I believe, the most dangerous person in America. I made a post on that. Um, I made a post on that this year. And, well, it upset it, some folks. And I don't care. Y'all know my statements. Jimmy crack on. And I didn't care then. The white woman is the most dangerous person in America. It is not the white man. It is not the Asian woman or man, the Hispanic Asian woman or man. It is not the Indian woman or man. No, it is the white woman. Why is she the most dangerous? Mm, well, it is obvious of the history of the struggle of African-American men and women in the fight for freedom, oppression, and Jim Crow laws, and these crazy uh, laws that tried to suppress us even though we were free. These laws suppressed us. The prison industrial complex, oh gosh, it's a whole lot of it. And we'll talk about it. And even the ADC policies, the public aid policies, all this stuff. All right. But uh, somebody said to a white woman and well, he lost his life. You look at some of these movies like Rosewood and all these movies where a, a black, a white woman just pretty much told her white husband, he looked at me funny and you were slanging on the tree. You became strange fruit. Uh huh. You, uh, when a white woman complains to her white man about something, it gets done. Uh-huh, yeah, yeah. Tammy, I didn't want to say the name, but you said Emmett Till, and there it is. Yeah. It is indeed and will be a problem forever. White women are the most dangerous. Number one, it's because as it pertains to to trying, uh, as it pertains to this white silence, white women are the worst at this. Because when they speak, then their husbands follow them. Understand that their husbands are afraid of them. I don't think y'all get this. I know just some white men watching this says, I ain't afraid of my, my white wife. Well, mm, systematically as a whole, white men are afraid of their white women. Look what's happening right now in politics and in social issues. They are afraid. They are frightened. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're just protecting our children, they say. That's what Tammy says. I'm trying to tell you. Listen, y'all. I Uber every now and then during the week. I get more white people in my car than black folks because where Uber takes me in Chicago, okay? And there are... A lot of times I have a white man and a white woman in the back seat. And whether they're sober or whether they're drunk, Daphne, the white woman always have the upper hand in the conversation. Karen? Yes. She always, I, I, whether they're rich, middle class, lower class, weed smoke, I don't care what class they are, that white woman always have the upper hand. She wears the pants in that conversation. She, it was her phone. It was her app who called the Uber. She's the one that does the tipping. She's the one that gives the instructions on what to do, where to go, where, okay? She does that. And she's the one that cusses him out in the back seat. I can't tell you how many times that I'm taking these people to their homes, their posh uh, mansions up uh, up north in Kenilworth area somewhere, and uh, the uh, the husband, the wife says, "Get out, man, Dan, get out, 
Okay, and he gets out, and uh, he, she says, "Go on and and raise the garage door. I need some." And then when when he closes the door, she'll say to me, "I hate that mother boop. Such a stupid son of a boop." I'm like, "Oh, oh my God, yeah, he he's just so stupid. I can't I can't stand him." And then he, look at look at his dumb boop. Uh -huh. And I, and I hear this a lot. Among and then, then they'll do it right in front of the man, and he like, mm -mm, well, <laughs> he'll laugh it off. <laughs> My brother used to be used to sell windows for Home Depot, and he walk in these white homes, and these black these white men were heralded as nothing in their homes. They were not respected. My brother said he walked in, he walked in, walked in, he walked in a home one time to sell uh, some, uh, some windows and the man had on a state trooper's outfit, I guess he was on his way to work and, and the children was calling him by his first name and telling him, yeah, shut up dad, you don't know what you're talking about. His, his little, little, I'm talking about toddlers was talking to the father like that. Okay. And my brother was like. It, wait a minute, you got a state trooper's outfit on you. And yeah, I'm on my way to work. And the wife was like, get, get the hell out, okay? My brother said, and he was on my radio show, and he said, this same white man who's not respected in his home will come, they're going to assign him to the black neighborhood, and that's where he feels empowered. That's where he feels. That's why white cops talk to you any kind of way. Understand that? But he talks to a white woman differently. Have you noticed lately when you that that woman who uh, got upset with two white cops because the cops pulled her daughter over or something like that? Did y'all see that? Blessings to you, Bears Bowden. Did y'all see that? And the white woman literally cussed those two white cops off out and the white cops are like, mm, okay, all, all right. Oh, yeah, you okay, all right. Well, have a good day. Now, the woman wound up losing her job because she was some type of city official. But it happens a lot. Why do you think the woman, the actor, the actress woman, when she got pulled over by a cop, why do you think she took her hand or a glove and, and slapped the cop? Remember that? It was a Zsa Zsa Gabor? Who was that? Okay? These white women don't care. Because they see a white guy. They don't care about the outfit, the uniform. They see a white guy. So my brother says, look, he's not respected in his home among his family. So he comes in your neighborhood and calls you niggas and make you squat, make you do this, make you do that. Because he feels that that's the only place where he is supreme and have the power. Because the white woman put the fear in this man. And he takes his anger out, Karen says, on you, black folks. Yes, he's assigned into the black areas because that's his jungle. That's his training ground. Yes, the white woman is the most dangerous person, not just woman, person in America. And I see it in my Uber car. I see it in their neighborhoods. White men are afraid of them. Look at this Me Too movement. Now, they, and the Me Too movement was formed uh, partly by a black woman. But look at, the, look at the fear that has come over these white men even more so now that these, white, these women are coming, coming forth from Donald Trump on down. The fear has always been there with white men. Now, black women are jumping on the bandwagon, and it's it's sad. Yes, that's right. Kendrick says, true white privilege is in the white woman. She is to be feared. All right, now, black women, you join their fight, but they never join yours. They never join yours. Okay, you was among a mob marching the women's march last year and this year you were among the mar the mob with your signs but they ignored you 
they they thanked you for being there. Ra ra ra. But you can't scream fire in a movie theater. That's against the law. Some black women screamed Black Lives Matter among those white women marching and they were ignored. They were ignored. Why do you think we have to look at white evangelicals? Okay, I look at many of the white evangelical women as being some of the most disheartening and non-compassionate towards our struggle. Now, you have to join forces with them in order for them to allow you in, but they will never, they can't. It's something against them that causes them not to join forces with you. All through the struggles of the 50s, 60s, or the civil rights you didn't, you didn't see a lot of white evangelicals. You saw liberals, but you didn't see a lot of conservative white evangelicals because they felt that's their fight. We're not getting involved in that. They didn't even uh, vote. They, didn't even, they were not even registered to vote. They're like, no, that's, that's y'all's little issue right there. They were fighting uh, for suffrage, for voting, and then when the bill would pass, many of them didn't even vote. Many of them didn't even register to vote. It's like the gays today. Many of the gays were fighting to get Barack Obama and the Supreme Court and Congress to pass this law so that the people, so the gays can marry. And once they got the laws passed, many thousands of gays didn't even get a marriage license. Yeah. No, we just wanted the laws passed, you see, because it's really about a system. There's, there's a method to the madness of people marching and rallying and what have you because again this 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 oh, women's march was not about black women it was not about asian women it was not about hispanic women it was about white women that's what the women's march is about it's about white women and 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 even the um uh, the feminism is really about white women's not being the same in makeup or body structure or strength that's not the feminist movement the feminist movement is about equality in politics uh, and in careers and and social and all these other things. That's what the movement is all about. But be careful because like any bill that is passed, there's what's called riders and rider clause in there. And even in your insurance, there's some riders there. And if you're not careful, a bill will be passed to make you feel like we're now free. We got what we want from Congress, but in there are some little things that, that will cause you not to benefit from the bill or, or the provision. Uh, the Civil Rights Bill had some riders in there. The, the War on Poverty, uh, that, that particular movement or bill from J.B., from, uh, what's his name? Anyway, uh, Lyndon Bain Johnson, had some things in there, okay? The war on drugs seemed like a great idea. Remember Ronald Reagan said, say no to drugs, and had his wife to campaign around the country, say no to drugs? That thing had more negative uh, out, uh, output than positive, and then the Clintons made it even worse. And then they went in and they decided to fix the public aid system, the AD, what's it, is it AD, what's it called, ADC or something, okay, to fix it, and they transformed it and made it worse for many people. Oh, man, I get it. Do you think that that's the only reason? What? Or do you think American history has been proven to have given white men a superior sense of power? Mm -hmm. And yes, these white women are absolutely crazy. <laughs> Uh, Bears, yes, a sense of power. Absolutely. Superpower. Uh, the United States once was a superpower. All right? This may seem like I'm going way left field. I have to go there because Bears took us here. The United States became a superpower after World War II. We showed the world who we were. All right. But in that superpower among the world, there was a civil war going on among the races. And much of that started with uh, uh, President Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson, that president that, that was in office who gave us that whole Federal Reserve and that whole 
that that uh, Ponzi scheme that we have called the, the Federal Reserve, the IRS and all that stuff, 1913, somewhere around there, 1913, 14, 15, I can't remember around there. Woodrow Wilson started this mess. And I think Woodrow Wilson was the most racist president in the 20th, the 20th century. The most racist president. And what he did was what Fox News does today. Fox News give white America the idea of who African Americans really are. So they teach white America who African Americans are. So these people never go into the communities and get to know these people for themselves. They just turn on TV and says that must be how they are because Fox News said it. Woodrow Wilson did that in the 1900s. And he was the first president to uh, uh, have a showing of, of a film in the White House. And you know what film that was? It was The Birth of a Nation. It was the most racist film ever uh, created and produced, probably still to this day. And Woodrow Wilson had a screening of the movie in the White House. And not so much him having the screening there didn't really change too much. It's what he said after the screening. He said, apparently, unfortunately, this is true. And his statement of saying this got to be true by these niggers chasing our white women and, 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 and the Ku Klux Klan was, was heralded as being saviors to save America uh, against the, the nigger race. He says this must be true. And white America from around the country adopted that. And, well, that caused this trickle-down domino effect to happen in uh, our lives and, and politics and, and, and job placement and social issues and religion and you name it everywhere because of that president. I believe in my heart of hearts. He was not the first racial racist president. I think every president prior to that, of course, had, had a lot of bigotry in him. Uh, but he made it. He, he made what uh, he set the pace for a Donald Trump. I believe that in my heart of hearts. Okay. So, through what he did, called, it strengthened the Jim Crow laws in the South and, and in the North. It, it strengthened the laws. And it, it altered the, the mindset of Congress, whether it was overran by the, the right or, or, or had a dominance of the left. It didn't matter. It was already there. And then y'all already know that it was the Democratic Party who gave us a lot of these laws, gave us gave birth to the Ku Klux Klan, Democratic Party. The Democratic Party gave us these Jim Crow laws. It's the Democratic Party who suppressed the, the voting rights. It, it's the Democratic law, a party that did a lot of this, yet African-Americans, we love it. Love the Democratic Party. The system switched over. So the Republicans who were the abolitionists of yesterday is not the same Republican Party who are abolitionists of yesterday. They, they are now the different. They are like the Democratic Party of yesterday. It's a whole nother story. Anyway, mm -hmm. so just look at recent events here. Black voters in Alabama, black voters in Alabama, Alabama, uh, specifically 98 percent of black women prevented Roy Moore, a homophobic, racist, and alleged sexual predator from being elected to the United States of America. 98% of black women did that. Watch this. 63% of the white women in the same election cast their vote for Roy more. Mm. And something else. Time Magazine selected the silence breakers. That's these black women, okay, that's okay, of, of the Me Too movements as their 2017 person of the year. Them. While failing to place the black women who created the movement uh, on the cover. Their faces didn't show up on the cover. 
It's like race records back in the 1960s and 50s, especially 50s, kind of started with 50s because the white kids were bringing music home that was created by black artists. And then the, in the onset of, of uh, Motown Records, Barry Gordy was a genius, a marketing genius, because he didn't put the faces, he put abstract pictures or what have you on the covers, but he didn't put the, too many black faces on there. They were called race records. Because the white parents didn't want no uh, uh, nigger faces uh, in the house. And a lot of times they didn't even know that these were black people singing these songs. Andre Crouch would tell the story of how he wrote these amazing songs, The Blood That Jesus Shed For Me, and gosh, uh, just so, so many, soon and very soon we're going to see the king. It won't be long, all these songs that white people were singing around the world. And he said he went to a concert one day. He was on the, he walked on stage, and when the people saw what color he was, he said the front row of white people got up and walked out. Mm -hmm. White evangelicals, you understand? They love God, but they do not like your color. I'm not talking about all of them because some white evangelicals are going to come on here on YouTube and comment about them. How dare you? You are, a, <laughs> you call me whatever you want to. He walked on stage and the people were upset that a black man was writing these songs that were saving us. That's white evangelical back then, especially back then, especially in the South. Yeah. So I'm going to get back to you black women who were chasing after white women's problems. Her problem was with her white man. You joined the fight, but you didn't have a problem with your black man. I got some statistics that I'll show you in a minute. <clears throat> I want to say to you, show me a man who cheats with a woman who's married. Show me a man, a black man. Show me a black man who cheats with a black woman who's married. And I will show you a black woman who cheats on a black man who's married. Or not. But she married. You're like, what do you, what's your point? There is <clears throat> this narrative in the black community, especially among African American women, that all men cheat. All black men cheat. They all the dogs who can't trust really none of them. So the man I'm with, I got to watch him closely because they're. So that's the problem with the black man. But unless he's gay, he's cheating with a black woman. Mostly, yes, he might bring a white woman in, but mostly he's cheating with a black woman. And if he's gay, well, there are a whole lot of lesbian, black women lesbians out there. You understand what I'm saying? So this talk of this is the problem, almost exclusive, that we can't trust black men because they're doing these things. But I also look at the population of both Men and women in the world and in America and the statistics will shock you. <laughs> Bear says hilarious. He says, I've said the same thing for years. I, yeah, it's amazing how we are the dogs, but yet the black women are sleeping with dogs. Because again, he's sleeping with the sisterhood. So the sisterhood is saying, how dare these all these black men and dogs but you're perpetuating. You're giving these men an, uh, an outlet to do these things. Uh, I walked in uh, to, 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 to yesterday. I felt horrible for the first time in, in, in a while. I walked into not a Hooters. What's the other organization that is a Hooters uh, that is Hooters um, competition. Number one competition. What is it called? Peaks. Twin, is it Twin Peaks or something like that? 
The media wave says, hey, oh, we have enough issues praying over the safety of our black boys and men to worry about someone else. <laughs> the media triplet. Okay, I walked in to Twin Peaks, which is Hooters' number one competition. I've been to Hooters before. Okay, I don't really like going to Hooters for the exclusive reason of the women being sashayed like they are. All right, I just don't like it. But they got the darnest, the greatest wings in the world. All right, so uh, I don't like it. So I put up when somebody invite me over, I'll, I'll put up with it. But I rarely go to Hooters. I can count on one hand the many times I've been to Hooters. Last night, though. I went to, I've tried to go to the AIM convention, the Church of God in Christ AIM convention, which is in Indianapolis. So I took a trip down there. It's only two and a half hours from Chicago. Hey, got car, we'll travel. I was hungry. So me and the buddy went to uh, Twin Peaks. And when I walked in the door, I knew what to expect. And this young Black girl hit me right in the face. She was one of the wait waitresses. And of course, her breasts, you know, they, they make sure that their breasts pop. Because they, they strap them really nice and tight. All right? And then they got the short, the Daisy Dukes on, okay? And they have a certain look, like stewardesses. They all have a certain look. And I walked in there with my friend. And as soon as I saw this black girl, my heart. Just fell to my toes. I felt horrible. I wanted to, for the first time, walk out of there. I was starving, y'all. I just said, oh, God, help me. And I saw that black girl. And you know what I saw? I saw my daughter, Rebecca. Why? She looked like my daughter, Rebecca. She had that little girl face. Uh, uh, sashaying around there serving food and the gimmick is the body and I said and I sat at the table with my friend and I almost started to cry I says I can't believe she says what's wrong with you I says this, this, this don't feel right this don't feel right it just don't feel right How how is this even legal in America how is this even, how is it that even a lot of Christians even come here and enjoy the food and the scenery? How do we even do this? I said, I'm so uncomfortable right now. I would rather we get our food to go. Their breasts have to touch the wall before their, their body does. <laughs> See, see what I'm saying? I felt like I was part of the problem supporting this. I can't go back to that place. I can't go back to Hooters. I can't. I can't ever walk in those places again. I can't. Because when your conviction hits you like that, that's something. Something is talking to you or someone is talking to you. Hopefully it's the Holy Spirit. And God has put something in all men. When that thing wakes up in you, it is best that you adhere to it and don't go there. Now this may not affect you when y'all walk into Hooters or these places, but it affected me deeply that when I even got home, I still was looking at that little girl's vision, saying this girl is probably trying to support her way through college. She probably, she may have a kid at the house. I don't know. Uh, but I says, gosh, do she have to do it this way? Yeah. I know Shantae says, can't, can't be in business if nobody eats. Yeah, I couldn't do it. I can't go no more. So if any of y'all want to invite me to Hooters, I ain't going no more. Because then I, I, you know, the sex ratio for the entire world population is 101 males to 100 females. For those of you who believe that uh, y'all keep reading the Bible scripture about this, seven women will grab home to one man. You guys are misinterpreting things, all right? Don't think that that's what's going on right now as far as population is concerned. That's not what the scripture is talking about as far as population is concerned. Because right now, population, there's more men in the world than there are women. There's 101 males to, even though there's only one more, 
There's one guy around there who just got born. He says, I'm the one. I'm the majority to 100 females. There's, but, uh, there's 125.9 million adult women in America. 129, I'm sorry, 125.9 million adult women to 119 million men. Okay? Understand that. So there's more women in America, but there's only a couple of more. There's only just a couple more women than there are men in America. White people make up about 77.7% since 2013 uh, census. White people make up more. That's why in the public aid system, they are on it more so because there are more of them. Understand that. So white means Irish, German, Italian, Lebanese, Near Eastern, uh, Arab, and Polish. That's what America considers white. It's 77.7% 7 of them suckers, all right? Black and African Americans in America only make up about 12.6%. All right, Barry says, how many of them are straight? <laughs> that's it, 12%. That's it. Shante says, uh, that's, not, that's not about population. It's, it's, added, it's, it's that's about uh, attitude. She's referring to my talk about the Bible, saying there's going to be seven women. So that's not population. It's just that there's more and more women that's going to be jumping on men. That's happening in America today. A lot of black women, I'm talking about black women right now, are desperate today. Extremely desperate. They just see it. They'll see a single man and they don't check his background. They don't check if he's is he working. They don't check if if he's got marital issues, meaning he might be single but he's still legally married. They don't check. None of that stuff. He's single. You single? I'm single. Bam. She's after him. And she'll put up what the things that he don't have, he could be homeless, he ain't got no car, he ain't got no job, he could have kids all over town, don't matter, and he could still be legally married. He might be just going through a divorce right now or a legal separation, it don't matter. There are a lot of women, black women, who still want him because she has she is passing her flower of time. She's she's got a uh, uh, I don't know. She's on a system where she's got to get to that goal, or something is happening. And I see it among a lot of Christian Pentecostal black women. Marriage pops up now more than anything. Marriage. Y'all can be on date one, and she's telling you what she wants in a husband. Y'all just went out for coffee and donuts and she's already talking about what she want in her husband. That's not the way it used to be. They used to court, court, courtship used to happen, used to go on for a little while. Y'all did a little date here and there and went here and there and talked about all kind of stuff, but you ain't talking about marriage. Day one though, in America, black women right away talk about what she looked for in, in her husband. Now he's sitting there listening to that and fear hits him. So you set the pace for him. You set the mood. You set the atmosphere. And now the only thing now he's thinking about is she's thinking about marriage. Now what do I do? Do I continue to date her? Uh, do, I, do I pull away? Now, I'm afraid to pull away now and we, because now there's a, what do I do? Because she got marriage on her mind, and I'm trying to get to know this woman. Oh man, I'm trying to tell y'all. You know, a salesman used to salesman used to come to the house, knock on the door. If the woman answers the door, what did the salesman ask the woman? Anybody? Somebody put the comment in the at the at the uh, in the bottom there. Somebody give me the answer. When the salesman used to come to the house back in the day, back in the 60s, 70s, and he knocked on the door and a woman 
came to the door, what did the salesman ask the woman? Anybody? 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 I know Facebook is a little slow. Okay? And Ursula said, may I come in? Yeah, he may ask where I come in, but he's going to ask her for someone. Uh -huh. Who is he asking her for? Thank you, Cheryl Dunlap. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Barris. Is the man in the house? Cheryl says, is your husband home? Yes. Why did he ask, is your husband home? Now, he, she could be white or black. It didn't matter. Because when I was a little boy and the, and the, the vacuum salesman or the encyclopedia man came to the door. When they did door to door, they asked, is your husband home? Even if you picked up the phone and called, cold calls, hello, uh, hi, who is this? This is so-and-so representing so-and-so is the man of the house. Uh-huh. Understand that. Now watch this. Then what happened was, if the man answered the phone, hello, hi, this is so-and-so representing the so-and-so factory of, of America, is the woman of the house home. What do you think he getting ready to sell to the house? Yeah. Yeah, you see what I'm saying? That's the way it used to be. Not no more. Not anymore. Now, because of the breakup, especially of the black family, if a man come to the house or ring the phone or what have you, he ain't never asking for a man. Why? Because he know. Ain't no man in that house. I don't care what he's selling. There ain't no man. And, and some who are selling insurance, sometimes they'll ask, is there a significant other? It used to be... Okay, I can't go there because I'm I'm upsetting y'all already. Let's talk about health as it pertains to the black man and the black and, and the women who are protecting the men. Because again, y'all are chasing after the white woman's struggle and fight with her husband. But what you're doing is uh, the the home has already been broken up by the system, the racist system of uh, of. Uh, Liber liberation and suffragists and feminism and public aid the, the black home was broken up through all that uh, and I'll go into that with the whole the, um, the, the, the employment issue or that was broken up and then the black man started getting becoming even more and more unhealthy okay you know who I believe Health-wise, killed more black men than anybody I know. Big Mama. <laughs> I'm in trouble now. I'm in trouble. <laughs> Woo -wee. Big Mama has killed more black men than anybody I know. There was a study done by a woman who was trying to teach the young ladies, the African-American women, to cook more healthy for their men. And then they had a meeting with the black men and says, we want you to survive. We want you to live a long life. And the men decided, you're right. Let's do this. I agree. Because I'm, I'm slow full. I'm tired. I'm fatigued. I'm having all kind of internal pipe issues <laughs> and plumbing issues. All right. Let's do this. And so they made a plea to the black women Big Mama, to cook more healthier meals. Stop using, y'all remember that big bucket of lard and, and stop giving them catfish and all these unhealthy and pork this and pork that. And, you know, we, we just, it's just, we're killing ourselves. It's soul food. And the black women refused. They would not change their cooking habits. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they weren't, they weren't changing. So these men were eating themselves to death. They were eating themselves to death. I know what you're saying. She says overwork and lack of exercise. Yeah, it's true. But they were also eating themselves 
to death. Wow. Mm. Chante say lack of sleep too. Uh, did you eat yet? <laughs> Chante Charles, be quiet. Uh, I ate, I, believe it or not, it's the first time I've done a Facebook Live that I actually ate something. And I slept for hours because, again, I haven't slept since my uh, birthday. Yeah, no pork in my kitchen, Karen says. Yes. Big Mama killed off a whole lot of black folks. I'm trying to tell y'all, y'all can disagree with me all you want, all you want to. Big Mama still killing y'all. Mm. Uh, let's understand what, what this... Uh, now, uh, feminism is the... It's saying here, the advocacy of women's rights on the basis of the equality of the sexes. I get that. Mm, yep, Karen, heart failure. Uh, the theory of the political, economic, and social equality of the sexes. Mm -hmm. The belief that men and women should have equal rights and opportunities. Mm -hmm. The doctrine uh, advocating social, political, and all the rights of women equal to those men. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you all something. All these could be, uh, 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 they, they're, they're correct and they're defining it. I get it. The word feminism uh, scares a lot of people, men and women, because it seems the word itself uh, sounds like it's anti-family structure, anti-Bible. Okay? Uh, and there are a lot of men who are feminists, believe it or not. Feminism can be both male and female. It sure can. That by the, by the definition of it, but when y'all join forces with these uh, advocacies and these uh, these groups, these social groups and these uh, uh, what what y'all call them sub subgroups, okay? When you join forces with these people, you don't you only see uh, the wide picture, but you don't know what's riding in their minds or, or what's really at the table because you're never called to the table. No, you don't come to... You, you You are the supper, but you're not at the table sitting there eating. You're not. We will agree, disagree. Big Mama are still here and men are done. <laughs> Shout out to Charles. I'll change the subject and cut it out. Is the man of the house home Janice Hops? Yes. Um, womanist. That is the word that black women choose to use. Mm -hmm. It's a pig. With lipstick. That's what it is. So, black women went out there to march with white women thinking that they were marching for the cause of all women. Not realizing, though, that the women you were marching with, many of them were bigots and xenophobes, and some of them were racist. Among them, see here's a, here's a, here's the blindness of what I see with uh, African Americans as it pertains to the Democratic Party. You think that all bigots are Republicans? There aren't no no bigots in the Democratic Party. That is the greatest trick, uh, at least one of the greatest tricks that Satan has pulled over you. You see. So it's the Trojan horse effect. You're marching with these people who never fought for you, who still ain't fighting for you. They're not. So the enemy, Democratic, the, the Democratic Party, uh, it really is a silent enemy. But the enemy of my enemy is my friend because they're talking against the Republican Party, those conservatives, those who are the, the Trump guys and those who are Fox News. So you are marching with them, not realizing that they're marching you off of a cliff. Uh, you ain't liking it and I don't care. I, maybe I don't like you either. Uh, now, there is a fight going on in the, in the validity of history as it pertains to the public aid system because they had a thing called the man in the house policy. Man out of the house policy. I think they called it that. Y'all saw the movie, um, uh, not Geraldine. I always call it called it Geraldine, but it's a what's the main name of the movie? That public aid movie back in the mm -hmm, with James Earl Jones. Um, the most powerful demon is the one that you are not aware of. Lisa Johnson, come on. That's it. You got to change the mindset. So you marching 
you're marching with the enemy and you don't even know it. White nationalist supremacists on both sides. Yep, the one thing they have in common is uh, the Negro problem. <laughs> Shanti Charles. Shanti Charles, we finally agreed. <laughs> now, okay, so uh, there are a lot of white websites out there, especially those that are conservative websites, will tell you that there was no such thing as a man out of the house policy. Claudine, thank you, Sheldon and Lap, that there was no man out of the house policy of the 1950s and 60s. Uh, they are, mm, there's a misconception that we need to talk about right now for the, for the couple of you who are going to hang around. All right. I found a, just an amazing article here, a particular fact, uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, said something that, that I found quite interesting. We, we've heard what he said about the public gay people, but the retreat from the safety net philosophy goes back to Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan. Okay, understand Woodrow Wilson is like the father of bigots among presidents all the way up. Uh, just because Lyndon Bain Johnson signed civil rights bill and the, and the war on poverty and all and the voting and all just because he signed those bills don't mean that he loved you uh, just because uh, John F. Kennedy did some things for you don't mean he loved you because he spent that first admit that first term he and his brother Bobby they was fighting against you they were the ones that was tapping the phones of, uh, uh, gave the permission to tap the phones of Martin Luther King. All right, so the Kennedys were not for you at first. There was a shift or a change in Bobby's life. Uh, uh, his brother died before we realized really what his play was, what, what he was going to do for African Americans. But if you go into a black home back in the day, you saw a picture of John F. Kennedy on the wall next to Martin Luther King next to white Jesus. On, on the one hand, politicians wanted to reduce the cost of welfare under Reagan policies of what he called a new federalism. Social welfare expenditures, they capped them, all right, under Reagan. Okay. On the other hand, uh, the demographic shift in the welfare roles, uh, it exa ex exacerbated the politics around welfare, welfare, and racialized this debate debate on 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 the uh, public aid system. So Ronald Reagan, he be, he used a certain term that that we quote even today. We call them welfare queens. Here's what he said. He says, "There's a woman in Chicago. She has 80 names, 30 addresses." 12 social security cards and is collecting veterans benefits on four non-existing deceased husbands. She got Medicaid, is getting food stamps and welfare under each of her names. Her tax-free cash income alone is $150,000. That's what he said. We realized, we found out that many, that, uh, or, uh, many of the whites were coming together to actually um, bankroll, bankrupt the system because they were coming together. There were some clips that I saw on the news and on social media and on YouTube of a lot of white men and women who were robbing the system. White America calls y'all welfare queens, but these queens ain't as smart as these who are coming together, these white people who are coming together and pretty much robbing the system. Uh, prior to the 1970s, when a couple divorced, uh, the man automatically got the kids. Hence the TV show, Family Affairs, and My Three Sons, Cheryl. That's, see, that's good. That's good. I'm glad you're here. Uh... A particular fact that those given the side eye of the American welfare system often trot out 
is in 1890, married couples headed 80% of all black households. That's right. It was hard fetched to find uh, to knock on the door of a black family and there ain't no man in there. At nighttime, 10 o'clock, you knocked on the door. The man answered the door in 80% of the black homes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, the figure held constant over the next seven decades through the 1960s. Try to tell y'all. Reagan took one woman and made her her poster child, his poster child, her poster child for welfare. Yeah, the image continues while the, they rob the system and blame black people and immigrants. I know. And they treat immigrants better because the guy who's got a dot on his head can come over here and set up a liquor store in your neighborhood and don't have to pay taxes for seven years. You go to the bank to try to uh, uh, get a loan to open up a business and they will deny you. I wonder why. Uh, the figure held constant over the next six, uh, seven decades. But by 1970, Lyndon Bain Johnson established social reform like WIC, uh, the special supplementary nutritional program for women is something like that. Infants and children, yada, yada. Food stamps, Medicaid, public housing, okay, that's, that's Dr. Johnson. Mm -hmm. Black families with mothers and fathers at homes had fallen to 64%. Oh, yeah. Black two-parent homes continued to plummet over the next 20 years, hitting a 38% low in 1990, where it has since remained. Mm. This socialist, uh, this uh, this uh, sociologist, and what's his name? Billingsley, acclaimed for his pioneer work tracing African American families. Okay, he attributed the abrupt change in family structure, family structure, not to welfare policies, but to rising unemployment. And I believe he is correct, although they both played a big part. Because what happened in the mid-1950s were technology changes that abolished unskilled jobs that most black men could do and created high-tech jobs that they could not. Tell you, that's what broke it down. Um, so uh, he explaining that, that, uh, that the advent of efficient goods-producing machines drove millions of black men out of the stable blue collar workforce. And that's what kept black families from getting and staying married, not the welfare system to stay, uh, to stay overwise, otherwise to say otherwise that is, is a misunderstanding of the data. And it's a misreading of history. So black men could not get jobs because the system was changing to a more technological uh, system. Gosh, you have to look at the Industrial Revolution. There's a couple of them. But the Industrial Revolution of the 1920s changed some things, but it actually gave an, uh, a birth of the blue-collar worker. So your dad left the house with a blue shirt on. He came back home. It was dirty. His hands were dirty. Machinery and interchangeable, uh, they called it, interchangeable things where you could, anyway, that's a whole nother, whole nother story. Uh, and so through the twenties and the thirties and the forties and the fifties, but then they began to mass produce certain things and the technology began to change. Black men were not trained on that technology. And you go to the white segregated schools and you see where they were training these white kids on how to, um, live in that particular society. In the 1970s, when I was coming up in school, they was teaching us Moore's Code in my school. And the name of my school was Moore's UPC. Oh, what a, what, what such irony. I was in Moore's Upper Grade Center, and they was teaching us Moore's Code in the 1970s, and Moore's Code had died 20 years prior. And the only one that was 
The military wasn't even using that no more. More the click, 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 click. They was teaching the black kids that. And I'm saying to myself, why do we need to learn this? And I was just a little boy. Why are we learning? Click, 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 click. Okay, when they got telephones and okay, and the white kids had this thing called a computer that they were introducing into the schools. Hmm, I wonder why. Uh, a black culture replaced with uh, degenerate behavior and what I call re <laughs> which is not caring about creating family, only getting paper with an ego field self. Uh, I, grand I can never say that word. Aggrandizing a lifestyle. There it is. I might have messed that up, but still, I get your point. They were locked out of available jobs, but they hired black women who were less threatening, creating the dynamic of inequality in home and denial. Of yep, that's right. Rob the man. So, was the man out of the house policy a real policy? It really was, and it started in New York. Oh, yeah. The notion that we have rules prohibiting fathers from living in the homes is simply not true, is what they were saying, who added that, that the agency does, does take income levels into consideration, but if two parents are working and don't qualify, we have a significant supply of other affordable housing programs, yada, yada, yada. On the subject of common misconceptions about this thing, HUD would like to clarify, they were saying. Uh, another idea swirling around is that people convicted of crimes aren't eligible for public housing under the national policy. There are only uh, two crimes for which we prohibit anyone from coming in, and that's if you sold methamphetamine or if you are a lifetime registered sex offender. All right, And it goes on and on. That's that's what their defense on. There was no man out of the house clause, although they wrote an entire movie on it. <laughs> All right. Now, then came the child support system battle. Uh, misunderstandings aside, many fatherhood resource organizations call attention to the ways in which men are discounted by public assistance programs that are designed around mothers and children under the welfare to work model currently used across the country, single moms can gain access to maternal health services, child care assistance, food stamps, affordable housing, temporary cash assistance, and job skills training. Meanwhile, the only time the system focused on the father is to collect child support payments. Hmm. I wonder why. The child support enforcement system isn't really concerned about whether the father is engaged in his kid's life. All it's concerned about is whether they're paying their kids, says Warren. From the government's perspective, if you have the ability to provide economically, then you're a good father. If you don't have the economic ability, then you're not. And the government doesn't see any value there. Yet there was a recent report by the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, that says more black men fathers are in the children's life more than almost any race in America. Mm, that's something. The father, the black father is not in the home, but that father is in the kid's life more than almost any race in America. Then in walked the Clinton bill. The new bill replaced the AFDC program with temporary assistance to needy families. They call it the TANF, T-A-N-F or something like that. Bill Clinton, the woman, y'all get it, y'all was getting ready, more woman, women voted for her than anything. Stricter working requirements required single mothers to find work within two years of receiving benefits. A five-year lifetime limit was imposed for receiving benefits to reinforce traditional family values, a core principle of the Republican Party. Teenage mothers were to be prohibited benefits and fathers who were delinquent in child support payments were threatened with imprisonment. There are a lot of black men, fathers, went to prison because they did not pay 
that child support. States were banned from using federal funds for certain groups of immigrants and restricted uh, the ability to, for Medicaid, food stamps, and what have you. What was the impact? Despite many black predictions, favorable outcomes were reported on the 10th uh, anniversary of the signing of that bill. Welfare roles had declined. Mothers had moved from welfare to work and children had benefited psychologically from having an employed parent. So there's not as many black women on welfare because many of them are working. And if they are on the system, they're getting a little bit to kind of supplement. They may have, you know, Medicaid. They, they got that green, that green card used to come. And they, they may have that, that card that have some food stamp, but not a, not a, just, just a little bit to kind of supplement. But they pretty much, they're working. And psychologically, the kid is benefiting from that as well. What did that do to the black man? It gave an empowerment, a, a state of empowerment to the black woman that she says, I don't need no man. What do I need a man for? But the problem here is, is not an issue of do I, I do I need a man, do I not need a man? It's it's a it's the issue of independentness of being able to do things on your own. Just because you're a woman don't mean you need to depend on a man to do everything for you. Understand what I'm saying? I raised my daughter to be independent enough to survive. But be dependent enough to understand that if a man falls in love with her and vice versa, that she can still supplement or take care of whatever his needs are. Understand? I had to teach my daughter balance. I didn't teach her like many of y'all are teaching your daughters to be independent. You don't need no man to do nothing for you. That's not what I taught her. I did teach her, though, is you need your own bank account. You need a good uh, score. Okay. Try to get it in the 700s. If you can, that'd be great. Pay your own bills, go to school and graduate, which she did get your own apartment, which she did get your job. She, she got, she wanted to get two of them. All right. And live, uh, uh, and know everything about your social and financial and everything and love God. And one day you're going to die and go to heaven. That's what I taught my daughter. And she's living that life right now. And then I says, now a man is going to come along. And you guys are going to date and you probably fall in love. Now, let me show you through how I treat you, how a man should treat a woman. With the hopes that your mama is doing the other side because I cannot mother you and your mother cannot father you. That's what I told my daughter Rebecca. Understand that. So this impact of uh, going in there and changing the public aid system did help a lot of people. But it also changed the mentality of them as well. A lot of the blacks from the South were suppressed from coming up here in the North and getting on the system. So the man out of the house policies were true. It started especially in New York. And it says, listen, what it did was it told the, it told the woman more so that we'll give you some public aid assistance. We'll be able to give you enough to take care of you and your children but if you decide that you're going to fall in love and get a man, then we are going to lower the benefits or, get, or take you off the benefits more so. What did that do? What it did was it caused a man to date a woman but decide not to marry her because they was afraid that financially they can't make it. Because it was pulling on this, 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 the, the system, the social system of the government. Can't make it. Guess what it did to the married couples? Do you not know that many married couples in the black houses, they divorced because they couldn't make it financially and they realized that uh, for me to be able to take care of you, I need the system, the, the government to do it, so I need to be out of the house so that the government can do it. Mm, I don't think y'all seen this. My father told me, he had a long talk with me, last year about this on our way to South Dakota. And he talked about the system. He talked to me about why he got off the public aid system. He's born in the 40s, so if anybody knows anything about that system, he do. He came through that. 
life of the 1960s and 70s and how there's nine of us and how he would take my mother to these doctor's appointments and he would go to the public aid office with her and the things they would tell my father, he says, I can't do this anymore. How they were, they were um, dictating to my father how he should run that house, how much aid he can collect. And even the hint of sterilizing my mama. No, you can't, you can't handle more babies. We say you can't handle more babies. We don't care what you say. We don't care what your Bible say. You ain't having no more babies. Or we're going to snatch this from you. My father says, never again will I allow the government to tell me what to do. And he got off that aid and never returned. There was more designed to keep us apart than, than together. I know. Okay. Hmm. I'm getting, I'm preparing a show and I'm doing this because I think it's important. I'm preparing a show to show y'all that you don't even need a marriage license to get married in America. You don't. Do you not know that the marriage license is still relatively new? Uh, uh oh, I'm in trouble. This goes totally against my Pentecostal upbringing. Mm, totally against. Am I telling you you don't you shouldn't get a marriage license? That ain't what I'm telling you. Mm, I ain't telling you that now. No. Don't go to your pastor and say that Walter Jones, I can't listen to him no more. But what I'm telling you though, getting a marriage license puts the government in your affairs. Marriage licenses were issued to a black man so that he can marry a white woman. <laughs> Marriage licenses also tells the government that they can go in there and take your kids if something you did to break uh, that contract. Mm -hmm. Marriage licenses have the same effect as a 501c3, which calls you uh, a creature of the state. You are a creature and a ward of the state. So if you go to the government, the king, to get a license to put you two together, now the king now is in between that, and he gave you the right. Not the king of kings, but this king gave you the right. So the government says, right now we pretty much kind of own the situation. And then we can, so that's why you can't just come to each other and say, I'm on divorce, I'm on divorce. You got to go to the king. He gave you the right to marry, so you got to go back to the king and say, we want a divorce. And the king can say, nah, I, I ain't, I'm not granting you a divorce. Yeah. If it were so, the king, the United States, or Congress can make a decision that we ain't going to let nobody divorce. If you're going to come to us for the license, you can't come to us for, because there's three parties. There's three signatures. There's his, there's hers, and there's the king. Now, y'all want to breach the contract? You got to go to the king. Oh, I don't think y'all, I don't think any of y'all understand any of this, any of this. So, in the scriptures, the man gave the woman what's called a writ of divorce. He didn't go to the state. He didn't go to the Roman Empire. He didn't go, to, no. He himself gave her a writ. Where, where does Rick come from? <laughs> Y'all wrote it up. You and him wrote it up. The government didn't write it up. Is there pros and cons to both license and non-license? Sure is. But it's still legal today. You can get married in America without a license. And it is bona fide. You are married. What do you think common law? Come from anybody ever heard of common law? Hmm? Any, any, anybody? In, anybody out there? Anybody out there? Yeah, two men, two people in certain states can literally live together for a period of time, and as long as the neighborhood consider them together as a couple, the law says, I guess they is married. <laughs> mm -hmm. And because they is married, we have to recognize it. 
and there are some restrictions here. Some restrictions as it pertains to suing this and and getting uh, child support or well maybe alimony and all this stuff. We're not taught this stuff because that doesn't really matter because you know I don't know why. So I think okay, how long have I been on this? I've been here too long. I've been on here an hour and fourteen minutes. All right, let me stop. Because I talk myself hungry again, Shante. I believe, here's where I get really too controversial, and I shouldn't do this in the same show. I believe uh, there's a difference between what Barack Obama's administration did to what the Donald Trump administration is doing for the black family. First of all, uh, the Barack Obama administration for eight years really didn't do anything for you. You just got excited you had a black man in the office. It, it felt good. I'm going to be honest. It felt good to me. And I didn't vote for the man twice, but it did feel good that we finally had a representation in there. But he never really represented you. Mm -hmm. he, he never really represented you. Um, which further proves that that because a man's skin is dark and now he is in a power position, don't mean he coming after you to help you with anything. It don't mean that. The studies have been done, and just look at look at these black congressional people in Congress right now. The, the black caucus has been around since the nineteen seventies, and for short hands, how can can y'all name anything that they did for you that benefited the African American community? Can you think of it? Now, there may be something that they did, but can you mentally think of anything that they did and you give them credit for it? Yeah. In, in, anybody? I, I'm not seeing anything. Anything? I, I don't see anything. All right. All right. Since y'all sat on that. Okay. Barack Obama. Eight years. Can't think of any policies. Okay. In, 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 any policies. That he... Any... Any bills that he might have vetoed or any any suggestions, any executive privileges that came forth from Barack Obama eight years that benefited you as an African American because of the darkness of his skin. Anybody? Any, 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 can I get a show of hands? Any, any horse shacks out there? Ooh, 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 Mr. Cartel. All right, anybody? Boom, boom, Washington. Any, anybody out there? No? Oh, man. I can't. I can't. I can't. This, this is not good. All right, what about Al Shopton? In, in, in anything, uh, David Brock and Blessings, and Al Sharpton. Did, did there's anything that you can think of that he did that benefited you so greatly that you could you you when you see him you just want to just bow. Mm. Okay, okay. Jesse Jackson, J J Jackson, J J Jesse, R Rainbow Coalition, Jesse. In, in, anything that he did that affected you as a whole. Black folks said. See, it's, it's because of Jesse we have all these things. No, nothing. This is, this is hard. Uh, Maxine Waters. She, Ma Ma Maxine Waters. Is there anything that she did? She's been, she been, she been there a long, long, long time. California? Is that what she yeah, yeah, the, the Congressional District of California, 43rd, 49th? Okay. Is there anything you can think of that she did? Uh, and she not, see, they say politics is local, and it is. All politics is local. Used to be. Not anymore. Not anymore. Ah. Oh boy. This is hard. This is this is hard. Uh Bill Clinton, who y'all said was the black the first black president who played a mean horn. He bailed on y'all. Y'all put him in there and he, he bailed on you. Especially in his second term. And he sided, he joined forces with N Newt Gingrich. Y'all know that guy? Remember that guy? Newt, mm, Newt, the Speaker of the House. Yeah, he bowed to the man. And because of his bowing to the man, many of y'all's fathers and grandparents are in prison right now. Mm. And they, they had three strikes. Yeah, yeah, his initiative for boys and his diversity department. 
but neither were really given fundings or legs, as they say, no dollars, no policy changes. Yeah, Shante? Mm -hmm. Ain't that something? Yeah. See, they have great ideas, these black people in office. They have great ideas. Great ideas. Okay. Donald Trump's administration. Ooh, I'm about to say something that's going to get, get ready to pee off. Everybody on here, including Ron Kelly, because Ron Kelly is an intelligent and very intelligent man, but I'm getting ready to upset him, too. <laughs> about to upset even Ron Kelly, y'all. Donald Trump today is probably the best thing that could happen to black people over the, in, since, gosh, in, in 20 Five years or more. Donald Trump is the best thing that could happen to a whole bunch of us. And not for the reasons you think I'm saying. Mm -hmm. See, uh, I'm a Bible man. Yeah. And a, uh, what God did to the Jews was said, y'all my people, I love you, but I got to teach you a lesson because you're stiff-necked. So I'm going to bring the oppressor in to oppress you. Barbara, you're already there. I'm going to bring an oppressor over to oppress you and wake your silly butt up. And then when he's done with you, I'm going to remove the oppressor. I may even de I may even do uh, destroy the oppressor. That's what God did all through Scripture. Ron says I'm not upset. <laughs> uh, y'all are y'all not hearing me? The children of Israel was told to do something they didn't do it. God says do it. I said do it. They, they didn't do it. God says do it. They said I, 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 I ain't doing it. So God gave them three strikes. Mm -hmm. So. God went and got an oppressor. <laughs> and he told them, I'm sending you fishermen. Then I'm going to send you hunters. And I'm going to fish you out. Put a worm at the end and put it in there and fish those Jews out of there. Because the Jews like the worm. Some of them decided, I don't like worms. So God says, here's a gun. Here's a rifle. Here's the NRA. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna send a hunter in there and he he gonna shoot you out of there. And that's scripture, y'all. Y'all want me to find it? I'll find it for y'all. I'll find it for y'all. Some of y'all already know where that is. Okay, that's what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see. I have to go here because because I th where is that thing? I think it's in Jeremiah somewhere. Jeremiah 16. Mm. Jeremiah 16, 16 is America. He is the best exposing thing that has happened to our community in a while. Shante, win the prize. I gave all my prizes away. So you you get what you can, okay? Just just hang hang in there with me, okay? Shante, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find a gift for you because you, you played this game so nicely. <laughs> you played this game so nicely. Uh, what, what am I going? Oh, Jeremiah 16 and 16 says this. Um, I can't read it, but it says here, But the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from the, all the lands whither he had driv uh, driven them, Ha! He drove them, and I will bring them again into their land that I gave unto their fathers. Behold, I will send for many fishers, said the Lord, and they shall fish them, and after will I send for them many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and from every hill and out of the holes of the rocks. For mine eyes are upon all their ways, they are not hid from my face. Neither is their iniquity hid from mine eyes. Oh, man, this is, 
I will go further, but it'll go into another subject matter. Donald Trump can be the hunter or the fisher, but he's something, and y'all are waking up to it. Okay, now, what is it doing to the black family? It's waking up a lot of these black brothers. I will say this. Uh, I also believe that most presidents are selected. I believe that even Barack Obama was selected. There's only a few organizations around the world, or only a couple of them, that rule the, the world. Uh, George Bush in the 1990s uh, was trying to push America into a one world order. Uh, he said it, so it shouldn't be a surprise to any of you, but y'all don't like the news. Let me see, one world order, George Bush. I wonder will, I wonder will he, will it play, there it is. <laughs> there it is. Uh, let's see, what does it say? Certain that we stand at a defining hour. Halfway around the world, we are engaged in a great struggle in the skies and on the seas and sands. We know why we're there. We are Americans, part of something larger than ourselves. For two centuries, we've done the hard work of freedom, and tonight, we lead the world in facing down a threat to decency and humanity. What is at stake is more than one small country. It is a big idea, a new world order, where diverse nations are drawn together in common cause, to achieve the universal aspirations of mankind, peace and security, freedom and the rule of law. Such is a world worthy of our struggle and worthy of our children's future. Notice the two things that he said. That is the antith antithesis of Donald Trump. world order new world order and the rule of law two things that goes totally against <clears throat> the Trump administration from the moment that Donald Trump walked on, on that uh, stage in January of 2017 he talked about America only. It was an address of nationalism. America, superpower only. We don't need none of y'all. He totally erased this man's speech. And he proved it in his inauguration address by pulling us from all of these co-ops. Iran deals, he pulled us out of uh, uh, that thing with the the European thing, there's so many things he pulled us out of. Uh, attacking and what NAFTA, he's attacking, um, he is peeing off uh, Angela Merkel, <laughs> our German, the German Chancellor. He peeing off uh, the President of the North, of Canada. He's peeing off the uh, president of France. Uh, he's, he's All these people who will go to fight, to go to war with us, our allies, he's peeing them off and pulling us out uh, of these. Uh, look at the last thing he did by pulling us out of that whole human rights association with the... Uh, yeah. You see what he's doing, right? So I believe that these... these Societies, I know we call them secret societies, but these societies who really run the world wasn't really expecting a Donald Trump. Because how can you 
possibly run successfully a new world order and have a superpower like America not play a part in it. Now, oh, now they want to be by themselves independent now. You understand that? And I believe, again, God is playing chess. And what is it doing to the family structure? It's actually improving the mentality of some who are being, or who are being forced awoke. They've been forced awoke. And some are going to sleep on this for until they die. But it's, they've been forced awoke. Noticed on the left that the United States is a strongly knit uh, liberal media. The liberals own all the media of, of the country, pretty much. Whether it's newspaper, print, or whether it's uh, on television. And so, all of them are going against this man which is causing uh, the, the division in America. So we're being divided and divided even more. But all of this is just setting us up for the November vote. You're going to see America, the awakening, the awakening. You're going to see a great awakening in November. I'm trying to tell you, this is the greatest chess game I've seen in my lifetime. The great awakening is going to happen in November by the, by the left. And it's putting fear in those who have power right now. And that's why many of them are losing their little races that they're having around the country. They're losing little races and it's shocking. And the way, what that? I've been in office for 20, 30 years. And this guy who was a, was a, a chef or uh, was at working at McDonald's is now in my seat. And I'm, yeah, that's happening now. I'm trying to tell y'all who's doing all of this. Donald Trump, he peeing off the whole world. But there is a there is a a method to the madness of God. <laughs> it is, okay. Now I'm not a predictionist, whatever you want to call him. I'm not even a prophet, but it don't take brain surgeon to see. Jesus said, "Oh, he said this." I'm sorry, y'all. This the after show. Oh, okay. This is what Jesus said. Uh, I have to. I have to use. Sometimes I have to use this because sometimes I be forgetting where I want to go because there's so much in my head. You remember? Uh, I did a. I did a. I did a sermon on. Is it? Is it John? Yeah, John, is it John? John 4. I better shut this down. Trump is a liberal playing a part of encourage people who have lost faith in the system to vote. Trump has always been a liberal. Trump has never been a conservative, ever. Look at his entire life. But, so what he was doing was, he's doing what the Antichrist is going to do. He's talking their language. That's why it's easy to captivate Christians. White evangelicals are a weak-minded people, just like black Pentecostals. Weak-minded, feeble-minded. Just speak, say God, Jesus, Holy Ghost, sing their song, and do their jig, and they will follow you. The Pied Piper easily walk in these churches. That's how he gets in, because he knows your language. Speak the language and you can get anything done. Just speak the language of man and you can get man to do whatever you want him to do. Mm. Mm. Okay. Oh, I'm in the wrong book. John. They're telling me to go to John. Let's see. Let's see what John 4 is late night Bible study. John 4 and 35. Turn your Bibles to John 4 and 35. Is that, is that what I want to go? See, now ye, there are, uh, ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. 
Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look. The... Nope. It's not where I want to go. Oh, maybe it's Luke 12, 56. Luke 12, 56. Let's try that. Can we try that? Luke 12, 56. What does it say? What does it say now? It say, yeah, this is the one. And he said unto, uh, uh, and he said also to the people, when ye see a cloud rise out of the west. I got to shut down on this one. Because this one right here going to bless you. <laughs> he says, when you see a cloud rise out of the west, straightway ye say, there cometh a shower, and so it is so. And when ye see the south wind blow, ye say, there will be heat, and it cometh to pass. Mm. You hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and the earth, but how is it that ye do not discern this time? Mm. Yea, and why even of yourselves judge ye not what is right? Ooh, yeah. that, that's a slap in the face. You know what he's saying here? He says, y'all are meteorologists. It's amazing. Y'all got Doppler radar in your head. Uh, when I watched the news at 10 o'clock, I talked about this. There's one guy who's got more power than everybody on that news. One guy. And they bring him up around 10, if it's a 10 o'clock news, he come on around 10, 15-ish. That guy. Y'all know who that guy is? You see, eh, when the news come on, he may say, breaking news. And uh, the anchor man or woman is a person who can only tell you what either happened yesterday or what's happening right now. That's all he can tell you. Mm -hmm. The sports guy comes on around 10, 20 maybe. I don't know. He can only tell you who won the game yesterday and who playing right now. But it's this one guy who's got the power to predict the future. What's his name, y'all? What's his title? Y'all call him the weatherman. The Lord gave this guy S E E R the ability to become a seer. He's seeing the future and he can tell you today, right now, is Tuesday. He can tell you that this coming Saturday is going to be 95 degrees cloudy and it's going to rain around 2 o'clock. Ooh, we. Nobody on the news could do that but him. He makes a prediction, and guess what? In many, many cases, he's spot on. And then, sometimes what happens is things change, so tomorrow he's going to update his prediction. He's going to say, wait, like on the whiz. Uh, the color now. It's no more red. The color is blue. Go ahead. Uh, dance, children. All right. That's what he do. He said, tomorrow, wait. We said it's going to rain at 2 o'clock. What we see is not going to rain at 2 o'clock. It's going to rain at 12 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Can't nobody else do that. The weatherman is a seer. That's what Jesus is saying here. He said, you're looking up and you see that it's cloudy and it's green. Matter of fact, he gave you the ability to smell the rain. Oh, man, y'all, it's too, this going too long. He gave you the ability to smell the rain before it even come. How many of y'all know what I'm saying? Hit the, hit the like button or something. Let's hit the, how many of y'all can literally smell rain and it ain't not one drop fell yet? Man, I'm telling you, he made y'all see us. But then he said, you see that I'm coming. I'm showing it to you, and you acting dumbfounded. Is this what he said? He said, uh, 
You hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it that you do not discern this particular time? Yeah. Black women, stay at the white woman's issues, right? Stay at the issues. And call them your sister, that's fine, because you we all of the human race. It's just one race. And they were made in your in, in God's image. Treat them as such, as you want them to treat you. Do that. Pray for them. <sighs> Stop running the streets with them and their causes. And I'm not teaching a separatism doctrine here. I'm saying stop running after their causes of equality with their husbands. Stop doing that. You got bigger bones to chew at, at, in, in your neighborhood. Your husband, your brother, your son, your uncle, your grandfather need you, black woman. And they need you to help them because men like myself walk outside and wonder, is this the day that I'll be pulled over? Is this the day that he say, show me your registration and I lose an arm because I told I did what he asked me to do or I lose my life? Is this the day that uh, this bank tell me no because I'm the wrong color? I mean, is this the day that I'm followed around the Asian shop and I'm just trying to pick up a comb? Is this, is this the day? We go through that. Not saying that the sisters ain't going through that, but brothers are going through that. We ain't in your home. So, it seems like the average black family is the girl goes to the bank and gets a mortgage. They used to, the mortgage lender used to say, where's the husband? Is it both of y'all buying this house? He don't do that no more. You went to the car lot. Where's the husband? Did both of y'all buying this car? He don't do that no more. Mm -mm. He said, no. You want this house? All right, let's run your report. Oh, good. Here's the money. You get your house, you got your car, your job, and everything, and now that poor guy out there, he's trying his best to make it. They'll hire you before they hire him. And then you go on social media and dog him out and talk about him like he ain't nothing. And then you go home and you you got sexual itchology. So that's why you have toys up under the mattress because you don't want no man, but you sure want his um his pro clip is um you you want to emulate even even the the lesbian woman want what God put on a man. Even she want that. That's why she that's why she go out there and get a woman that look like a man. They bring in manly toys because you know, they don't want the real deal. Now that's a that's an internal mental issue there. But uh, but those of you who say I just wish black men were more this more that and then turn around and perpetuate or allow the government to do this to these black men, you part of the problem. You putting on your pussy hats. And you're marching with the white woman. And then you say, black lives, they say, hey, ooh, that ain't this kind of party. Hmm. I know. Clarence says, I sound like Sister Ali. Who is Sister Ali? Who that is? All right. I think I've upset y'all enough. You got any questions, questions in the comments? Uh, YouTube is probably, yeah, they cussing me out right now. Ooh, they don't like me today. But y'all know, I always insert my ministry calls. It's called, I don't care, dot org. Hit the share button if you will. I'm going to eat something because I talk myself hungry again. And see what's happening tomorrow uh, on um, White Folks Holiday. It's tomorrow. And many of y'all spent a lot of money on fireworks in Indiana because in Illinois it's illegal. So you go across the border, go to Boomland, 
get your fireworks, spend all that money, come here, and you got to hide it from the police. Mm -hmm. And the uh, state troopers are pulling y'all over at the border because they know they saw you at Boomland, and then you got to put it in the trunk looking around. And then as soon as you cross the border, they pulled you over and said, hey, pop your trunk. Oops. Yeah, yeah. And y'all gonna be pop, 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 pop. And y'all gonna dress yourself in the American flag. Stripes and, and stars and stripes forever. And say, oh, it's all about a party for y'all. Not realizing that in 1776, you was a massa. Uh, can I, can I go bust up the shift roll after I go pee? All right, nigga, go ahead. Thank you, master. You show his kind of me. Mm, that, that was 1776. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. 1611, or was it 1619? They say, come here. We're about to put chains on you. And these chains going to be on here for about 400 years. <laughs> I got to go. I done upset the crew enough. Shante Charles, blessings to you. Clarence, blessings to you. Cheryl Dunlap, blessings to you. Ron Butler, um, Ron Ke Kelly. Sorry, I call you Butler because there's a Butler here as well. Uh, Dr. John Butler. The great Dr. John Butler is here. Sorry, I, I intertwined the two of y'all. Why don't y'all take me out to dinner or something like that? We all sit at the table and talk about matters of the heart. Mm, since I intertwined y'all's names. All right? And the rest of y'all who are left, I think about 14 of you, uh, pray my scrimpfuses. In the Lord, and uh, thank you for your happy birthday wishes. It was one of the greatest I've had so far. But it's back to get back to it's time to get back to work, and uh, let's um, see if we can empower our cheering in this Trump administration again. He the greatest thing to happen to some of y'all. He's oppressing, but y'all waking up. Look at you. Look at you waking up with your wake up selves. Look at y'all. I'm impressed. Now, oh, now y'all want to wake up because you slept for eight years during Obama's years. You slept. And while y'all was asleep, the enemy came and sold tears. Ooh, now you want to wake up and separate the tears from the week. You can't do it. All right. Love y'all. This is the Walter Jones Show. <laughs>